Hey Samfam, this is Ria from Samaya. And now we'll start our how to write audit also and uh, with professional ethics. The PDF that was used here will be uploaded in our Telegram channel. And the source material is ICS Quick Reference, which is very colorful and very compact. And it is very good to revise it in one day before the examination. And um, with that said, first we'll see the fundamental principles of the Code of Ethics of ICI, that is Integrity, Objectivity, Professional Competence and Due Care, Confidentiality and Professional Behavior. You have to remember all these five points. That is, uh, see this, there is no professional skepticism here. It was mostly asked in the MCQ, very often asked. That is, it is professional competence and due care, but not professional behavior. What? What are fundamental principles of Code of Ethics as per ICII is integrity, objectivity, and professional competence and due care, confidentiality, and professional behavior, not professional skepticism. And with that said, but nevertheless, the auditor has to maintain professional skepticism throughout the audit. And with that said, these are a few regulations before shifting into the clauses and schedules. Okay. First, the member in practice. The member in, of the institute is now permitted to use the word CA. That is, if you are a member of Chartered Accountants ICI Council, you could use the word CA. But there were few cases where if you are in practice, you could use CA. That's fine. But you cannot use any description like specialization in GST or you have got AIR, All India Rank and all. You have to not use all that kind of things when you are in practice. But if you are a not in practice that you're a member and you have in, in, you have been to industry or doing a job, etc. Then you can use the word uh, prefix as CA. If you are using that CA, you have to not use any kind of description. But if you are not using CA, then you could use description. If you are not in practice, this option is not available for members in practice. And with that said, we'll move on to the second topic that is maintenance of branch offices. That is as per section 27 of the ca act every person every office need to have a member of institute as a separate in charge for that office however there were exemptions that were given if the members were practicing in hill areas the temporary the, those conditions were the temporary office in a city that is in plain that is not under hilly region for a limited period not exceeding three months in a year that is he could move to plane that is less than three months or at least three that is minimum maximum three months he could be at plane that is maximum he has to be to practice in hill station then he need not have a separate in charge for this temporary office that is here in the plains the regular office that is which was in hilly region need not be closed during this period and all correspondence can continue to be made in the regular office the name board of the firm in temporary office should not be displayed. Temporary office is again at the planes, should not be displayed at the times other than the period of such office that is permitted, that is three months here. At that time, the office has to be open. Only at that time, the board has to be displayed. The term, the temporary office should not be mentioned in the letterheads, visiting cards, or any other place of business of member of firm. Okay. And before commencement of every winter, it shall be obligatory on the member to inform the institute about opening of the temporary office after the office is closed at the expiry of the period of the period of permission and intimation that effect should not also be sent to office by institute by a registered post. What does he say? At the time of opening, at the time of close, they have to intimate to the institute. You see, temporary office not exceeding three months. Temporary office, it plains. Regular office that is at hilly region should need not be closed and the name of the board in the planes that is temporary office should not be displayed other than those three months and temporary office address should not be there at any letterheads etc and they have to intimate to the institute and you see after with regards to the branch offices and all what happens if a chartered accountant has two offices okay if there were two offices the other person uh, that uh, the p other person who is in charge of the second office has to be a partner or a paid assistant he has to be associated with the chartered accountant as a partner or a paid assistant if he is a paid assistant he has to be in whole time employment and that's one point and with regards to some uh, conditions or uh, with regards to some council decisions there were few points here with regards to the use of name board there is no bar in putting up the name board in place of residence of the member even at his home he could put his the firm board and with exemption may be granted to a member or a firm in practice who have second office 
without a second office being under a separate charge of the member you see there were two conditions that were here you see for a temporary office there need not be a separate charge for second office if at all there have to be a second office it has to be under either partner or paid assistant and the second exemption that uh, the second office need not be at a separate charge is by satisfying all these three conditions if a chartered accountant is practicing in hill area he could go for this one and if not he has to check this for any other person the second office is located in the same premises in which first office is located or in same premises or the second office is located in the same city or the second office is located within 50 kilometers same premises same city within 50 kilometers if any of these conditions were by the chartered accountant was satisfied he need not have a separate charge for the that office by the another chartered accountant or a paid assistant as uh, the chartered accountant is maintaining two offices if he satisfies any of these conditions three conditions then he have to declare one office as his main office for his professional business and the CEO in practice also has to comply some KYC norms with regards to his clients so he has to take these all documents in order to comply with the KYC norms which are mandatory they were mandatory in nature so when a client is an individual or proprietor what all he has to take on category A we have some general or generic information with regard to the client that is name of the individual or any identification cards like PAN card or Aadhaar card or business description what his uh, business into and a copy of latest audited financial statements and with regards to the engagement that he is going to perform for the or, uh, perform for the client that is individual or proprietor the type of the engagement they were talking about they were client was engaged into and with, if the client is of a corporate entity what's the generic information with regards to the entity name and address of the entity with its description name of the parent company in case of a subsidiary if this corporate entity is a subsidiary then the name of that parent company and a copy of latest audited financial statement you see name everything was uh, right but in place of pan and other we have asked for the parent company like for anything and demanding all were the same and for the b category that so b section that is engagement information the type of engagement information. and for the regulatory information which is not present in individual proprietor client or you have to have company pan which we have missed right company pan company identification number that is sin number and director's names and address and director's identification number that is din number sin din and company pan and director's name and address and if it's a corporate entity if it's a non-corporate entity like a partnership firm or a trust with the general information he has to take name and address of the entity copy of pan description you see pan and uh, pan was compulsory for all clients business description but only for the corporate client it was in c category that's regulatory and a partner's names and addresses along with their pan and din if at all they have and copy of latest audited financial statement and if it regards to engagement information the type of engagement and now we'll go over discipline procedure mechanism under ica if any member of the ICI have against them have received any complaint or any information that they have done misconduct then what a disciplinary director will do a prima facie analysis and form a prima facie opinion then if he founds that the member against whom the complaint was given it founds not guilty on a prima facie opinion then it submits all the information to the board of discipline what the board of discipline do it either accepts or rejects it if it's accept that the member is not guilty then the matter was closed and if it's rejected rejected that the member is not guilty that is as per the opinion of board of discipline the member is guilty then what it will do it will do three things it will further ask advise the director of discipline to further investigate or it may proceed if the member is guilty under for schedule and it will forward if the member is misconduct or on his guilty under second schedule to disciplinary committee he uh, board of discipline could do three things further investigate it may proceed if that member is guilty under first schedule or it may forward to 
that disciplinary committee if the member is guilty on the second schedule this is what with regards to on the prima facie opinion that the member is not guilty if the dd disciplinary directorate thinks the member is guilty if it's under first schedule to whom uh, he has to report for the board of discipline as it was all dis uh, discussed or um, dealt with board of discipline with regards to the misconduct under first schedule if it's guilty if the member is guilty on the second schedule then he will forward to disciplinary committee okay first we'll see if he is if he is misconduct under if he is guilty under first schedule the matter is placed before board of directors and board of director rejected that that he is not guilty then the matter is closed there but even for the board of discipline accepted that the member is guilty under first schedule then it would conduct a inquiry and in that inquiry if the member found guilty then he will be primed the member that is they will uh, remove their they will uh, primed the member means uh, to remove from what all the position he was in if he was uh, auditor of some companies he will be immediately uh, they will remove them from that position and remove the name of the member from the register of members for up to period of 3 months and impose a fine up to 1 lakh if it's all if he is a guilty under schedule 1 That is first schedule. If he is not guilty after the inquiry, then the matter was closed. If the member was, uh, as per a disciplinary director, he was guilty under second schedule, they will forward the matter to disciplinary committee. And after disciplinary committee e examines that, if he rejects that, the if he reject that the member is not guilty, then he, the matter was closed there. If disciplinary committee also believes that the member is guilty under schedule second schedule. then it will conduct a inquiry and if they found s yes, that is the member is guilty then primand the member primand the member is to remove from the job what are they were in remove the name from the member permanently you see here is up to 3 months and for for schedule this is they'll remove permanently or for any other duration they have not given any maximum time limit for that and impose a penalty up to 5 lakhs if after of the further inquiry if the member was not found guilty on the second schedule then the matter was closed okay now we and now we have left with two case scenarios where the members were found guilty at a first schedule and second schedule and any member or dis director discipline aggrieved by the order of the board or disciplinary committee that is board of or disciplinary committee that is the the one who has been here right and who is director of discipline we have seen him here right that is when the board of discipline thinks he was not uh, guilty that is he was guilty the member is guilty when disciplinary directory thinks they were not guilty then they can prefer an appeal within 90 days what the appellate authority could do it could either confirm modify or set aside the order that were given by the board of discipline or disciplinary committee or impose set aside or reduce or enhance penalty this is with regards to the penalty first thing with regards to the order what all they could do confirm modify set aside the order second thing impose set aside reduce or enhance the penalty remit the case to board of discipline or disciplinary committee for reconsideration they can refer them back and pass such order that authority thinks fit and now we'll discuss the main portion of clauses here and first clause with regards to member in chartered accountant in practice would be guilty if he allows any person to practice in his name as chartered accountant unless that person is a chartered accountant that is in order to practice in his name he has to be compulsorily a chartered accountant and he has to be either a partner or he has to be an employee of that firm employee of the employee of him and in clause 2 if he pays he would be guilty under clause 2 if he pays or allows or agrees to pay or agrees to allow directly or indirectly any share commission brokerage if he pays or allows to share, uh, to directly or indirectly any share or commission brokerage in fees or the, or as a profits from the professional business which is his main source of income to any person other than member of the institute or any person other than uh, any other professional body that is member of ICI allowed member of any other professional body allowed and partner allowed retired partner also allowed or legal representative of deceased partner is also allowed three partners and two professional members were there and they have to be allowed where they provide renders professional services inside or outside india no problem treatment of goodwill in case of death of or ceases in practice if it's a partnership firm if at all the partnership agreement contains any kind of or uh, 
provisions to share the profits to the legal representative of the deceased partner they may continue to receive the share and if the proprietary firm no sharing of fees was allowed for the legal representative and the one who purchased that partnership firm but however the payments of that could be given in installments and if the death is after 3899 eight providers a sale is completed in all aspects within a year of such proprietary concern that is sale was completed within one year the name of would be kept in ambience and not receive not removed on receipt of the information about the death and uh, if there was a dispute with regards to the legal hire and that dispute should be kept uh, that dispute should be intimated to the institute in order to not remove the name uh, till one year and uh, this was uh, not relevant for now and uh, if all partners in the partnership firm dies then council will decide and uh, the member would be the CA in practice would be guilty under clause 3 part 1 first schedule if he accepts or agrees to accept any part of profits of the professional work who is not a member of the institute that is he is accepting here he was giving he was giving the share of profits etc now here he is accepting the profits from the professional work of not member of the institute and fourth clause is enters into partnership in or outside India with any person other than chartered accountant in practice or a person or a member of any other professional body you see then he is guilty under clause 4 when he enters into partnership other than the member of the institute or any other professional body member in clause 5 he will be guilty if he secures either through the services of any person who is not an employee or not a partner or by means not open to chartered accountant any professional business that is he's securing work through the services of a person who is not his employee and not his partner in clause 6 solicits clients or professional work either indirectly or directly from a circular advertisement personal communication interview or by any other means that is he's trying to attract the clients or professional work through that that's strictly prohibited under clause 6 but a chartered accountant may apply or request for inviting some professional work for ch from another chartered accountant in practice not through by means of circular advertisement personal communication or interview and a member from responding to tenders he is allowed provided minimum fees was uh, there in the tender document itself and uh, he'd be guilty under clause 7 if he advertises his professional attainments even his degree other than chartered accountant unless it is a university degree on professional documents visiting cards letterhead sign boards these were all negative list so here he cannot advertise his professional attainments unless uh, he could advertise through a writer post setting out service provided by him or particulars of the firm etc in a guideline and uh, in clause 8 he would be guilty if he accepts a position as an auditor without previously communicating to the previous auditor and clause 9 he would be guilty if he accepts the appointment without ascertaining or without complying with the requirements of section 225 of companies act 1956 or that is what the eligibility criteria is right uh, 139 appointment of director 140 and 141 all the ethical requirements and all and he would be guilty if he charge percentage based profits that is in clause 10 he would be guilty if he charges the fees as per percentage of profits but there was some uh, general exemption that were given with regards to the fees if he is acting as if the member is acting as a liquidator then he could charge a percentage of fees on the realization of the assets if he is auditor of chart uh, cooperative society he may charge the fees based on a percentage of paid up share capital and working capital uh, remember this this was asked in the mcq and in this could be asked in various MCQs, right? But mostly this was asked. In case of a valuer, they may charge based on a percentage of value, property of the valued. And the case of uh, management consultancy services, they may take percentage on contingent upon the findings of such work. If he is doing any kind of fundraising activities, a percentage on fundraised. If he is doing debt recovery, services percentage of the debt recovered and he's giving services of cost optimization percentage on the benefit derived any other services decided by the council this were the restrictions there they were exempted where he could charge the, his fees based upon the percentage of the work that he is doing and he would be guilty under clause 11 if he engage in any business 
but exception exception was he could be a director unless he is a no auditor director is a positive list but any business or occupation is a negative list unless they were permitted by the council and clause 12 he would be uh, he would be guilty under clause 12 part 1 first schedule if he allows any person not being a member of the institute to practice as a member not being his partner to sign on his behalf of the firm any balance sheet or profit and loss account etc these are we have completed our first schedule part 1 and all clauses we'll move on to part 2 where the professional misconduct when members were in service these all part 1 is for the chartered accountants in practice now they were in service first uh, they will be mis- guilty under they will be guilty under clause 1 part 2 of first schedule if they pay or allows or agrees to pay directly or indirectly any person any shares of emollients emollients like any incentives or cash payments for of the employment undertaken by him that is a part of his salary if he is paying and second uh, clause was if he accepts or agrees to accept any part of fees or profits or gains mm-hmm. from a lawyer or a chartered accountant or a broker engaged in such company firm person or agent or customer of company firm that is a lawyer ceo or broker of the company that he is working in he should not accept any kind of profits or any kind of shares or fees and now uh, as per clause 1 he should not pay also and now we'll move on with part 3 of first schedule when the under that clause 1 part 3 talks about the professional misconduct in relation to members in generally that is both practice the practice the one who were in practice and the one who were in service were also included here under clause 1 part 3 first schedule not being a fellow of institute acting as a fellow of institute that is not being a member is acting as a member and uh, under clause 2 he will be guilty if he do not supply any information that was called by all the parties that we have seen in the disciplinary uh, system mechanism right the board of discipline disciplinary committee director discipline etc and under clause 3 he would be guilty if he gives false information while inviting professional work in which he was allowed that is while what we have discussed here right through write up and setting up of services of with guidelines and all he could uh, advertise his professional attainments and all right in that if he gives any false information he would be guilty under clause 3 part 3 of first schedule under part 4 there was other misconduct this is with regards to the professional misconduct and this is with regards to other misconduct if he had been he would be guilty if he had also uh, been offended as for punishment for imprisonment for a term not exceeding 6 months that is till 6 months it comes under first schedule the after first schedule that is after 6 months it comes under second schedule and in clause 2 of part 4 first schedule in the opinion of the council it brings disrepute to the profession that he has done some act that which brings disrepute to the profession is uh, he will be guilty under clause 2 part 4 of first schedule this is with regards to the first schedule now we'll see second schedule part 1 that is clause 1 when he discloses any kind of information that he had attained through his professional engagement that he would be guilty if he discloses that and uh, under clause 2 he would be guilty if he certifies or submits his name or firm name on report of examination of financial statement unless that were done by a, him himself or partner or employee that is he should not certify or include his name or firm name unless he do the examination of the financial statement and third thing is giving his name on the estimations of earnings like of financial projections etc he should not use his name and uh, with regards to four when he expresses his opinion on a firm or a, any kind of business in which he is substantially interested in he should not do that so or when he fails to disclose a material fact which is not disclosed in the financial statement clause 5 and 6 when he fails to report a material misstatement and clause 7 he do not exercise any due diligence or grossly negligent with conduct of his professional duties and a clause 8 he would be guilty if he fails to obtain sufficient information with regards to the expression of an opinion so these all are the basic duties of the auditor if he do not comply with them he would be guilty on the second schedule when he fails to invite attention to any material departure from generally accepted procedure of audit that is applicable to the circumstances and you see the auditor has to do audit as per standards of auditing 
but when when he when he got some circumstances that he has to deviate from the standards of auditing he has to give the information he have to draw an attention to that if he fails to do that he would be guilty under clause 9 and if he fails to keep monies of his client other than fees or remuneration that is like tax amount if anybody pays gst amount and all you'd be auditor would pay them for all the otp purposes and all if he expends that and he do not put it in a separate bank account he would be guilty under clause 10 part one of second schedule and now we'll see part two of second schedule this is general professional misconduct in general where chartered accountants in service as well as in practice do for when they contravene the provisions of this chartered accountants act they were guilty under clause one part two second schedule and part clause two is if being an employee discloses confidential information that he got through his course of his employment and uh, clause three is includes any information that is false with regards to all the parties in the disciplinary provision you see here if you don't provide information to them it is in first schedule if you provide false information it is in second schedule okay please make a note out of it and gloss for default kits or embraces money received in professional capacity and there was also a part three with regards to that he would be guilty with any kind of civil or criminal court offense which is punishable with imprisonment of a term exceeding six months that is part three of clause one only one clause is there in that part three and this we have completed our professional ethics summary and now we'll do some important questions and apply these concepts and do check out the pdf that was given in our telegram channel where we have included few kinds of uh, regulations from which general permissions work have to be given which need not be remembered well so we have not discussed that in detail but it has to be uh, useful it would be very useful in writing answers and answering the questions that what we have seen with regard with regards to that and how the network could be formed with regards to the chartered accountants form and since auditor could use write-up for advertising how could he use that write-up and what all the recent questions in ethical standards board which was which would might be asked all the important portion will have been already discussed this is not this is for the students who don't want to take a chance or who are preparing for the rank uh, exam exemption and um, that's it do check out the channel and uh, read this and now we'll just quickly wrap up or find a way to remember the clauses there as we have read a lot of clauses and uh, as part one of first schedule and part two for second schedule and these since these were 10 and 12 uh, we just prepared only for this because in examination we often write it in a rough note like this in order to not write wrong answer wrong, wrong clause number and all because writing correct clause number is very efficient even to gain marks now if the clause number itself is wrong they would bluntly wrong the answer for that for the first one part one of first schedule we'll see part one of first schedule name this is and name is the one here and two commission is the way you get this commission and three the r like this here goes with the profits here this is to remember this is to train your mind or uh, to write it or uh, if you write it in your uh, like in rough notes in the examination to uh, it is to train your mind to write the correct uh, keyword against the correct number obviously we remember numbers and for the O here it is like partnership if most of us ever who was cursive writing write f like this right for that we have turned it into p like partnership for this and this five is like more secure business six is soliciting of clients and seven the dash here goes with the a4 dash advertisement is professional attainments a4 eight for acceptance of without information that is without giving intimation to the previous auditor nine for not checking the compliance of the act and all ten is taking percentage of profit eleven is for the business and twelve is for sign that is sign here that is even with cursive writing this is to train your mind while writing the rough notes and under a bit of a last page of your answer sheet so that you don't miss out the keyword and for the disclosures here the part one second schedule for the disclosure clause one disclosures l big one here and for the two where the auditor gives his opinion for not examining a financial statement this was like this for no examination and the future here for this is for the projections financial projections for the future and the express here expressing opinion on which uh, he was substantially interested in 
for the fourth clause of oh, but angle difference expressing opinion disclosures for the five and six for the report and seven is prohibiting or due diligence or maintaining a gross negligence and eight for sufficient appropriate audit evidence and um, nine is for attention and ten is for the money and this is what with regards to some tips to remember uh, while you are writing the rough notes in your exam to remember the keywords for the clauses of part one of both schedules and with keeping these in mind or uh, try to write it two to three times it is not something you read you have to train your mind to write this against the correct keywords and with that said we'll just move on on discussing the important questions that were asked in mtps rtps and a few past examinations and with that said we'll be completing all our three stages and you have to do the compiler portion just 30 minutes it would be enough more than enough now first we'll see one question here which was asked in mock test paper that was recently released okay and see vasu a newly qualified professional with certificate of practice approached ca anand the auditor of the father's company and allowed his what who this anand allowed vasu to have some professional or practical knowledge and um, he asked allowed him to sit in his office that is anand's office and allotted a small shampoo what do anand do anand do some tax consultancy work and he also allowed vasu to file few it returns and represent himself before various tax authorities on behalf of the firm that is vasu is representing himself before tax authorities on behalf of firm even though he did not have any kind of employment or neither he was a partner nor he was an employee of the firm he did not get any salary he's not an employee or share of profit or commission that is he's not a partner and he agreed only to pay usual expenses like conveyance and after the end of the period he was given a lump sum amount of 2 lakhs by ca anand for out of gratitude okay give your comments with reference to ca act okay you see ca uh, anand what he had done he had allowed ca vasu to provide they have also to provide what like some representation services and filing it returns and all and use his name on behalf of his firm that is use the name of the firm and himself who is not a partner not an employee of him but uh, under which clause he would be guilty he would be guilty under clause 1 part 1 of first schedule that is allowing his name to be used by a chartered accountant who is not a partner or a employee so we'll see how it is written first they have given the clause name and then they have written the provision with regards to that that the chartered accountant in the practice shall be deemed to be guilty of professional misconduct if he allows this is from where the colorful para starts there if he allows any person to practice in his name as a chartered accountant unless that person is also a chartered accountant in practice or in partnership with him or employed by him and this is till here they have written the provision or introduction provision for that for this mark you'll get one mark for the writing correct clause and you'll get a entry ticket uh, for the examiner to read the remaining portion if you write this clause part only wrong the examiner will not check the whole part whole answer even you have written the same correct and uh, for the provision you'll get one mark this is for five marks okay and the above clause in, is intended to safeguard the public against unqualified accounting practicing under the cover of qualified accountants this is the reason that we have that they have given the intention of the provision okay if you know you could write or you may uh, adopt from it here there's no uh, importance with regards to that it ensures that the work of the accountant will be carried out by chartered accountant who may be his partner or his employee and would work under his control and supervision in this instance this is all with regards to the understanding how you have understood the provision this is a clause and till here the provision and this is how you to interpret the provision how you have interpreted this is this portion you could write it your own you need not by heart this portion okay or you may adopt it from here in the instant case that is after the clause introduction and your interpretation of the provision you have to write the present case you have to jump into the scenario here see anand allowed vasu to sit in his office or uh, this is what the question talks about and he also allowed to appear before various clients on behalf of the firm this is need not to write it from your own head you could write it from the question itself see vasu was reimbursed useful expenditure and given a lump sum of two lakhs for his gratitude and for this you will get one more mark for what 
what you have written uh, from seeing the question itself, you will get one mark. Thus, in the present case, this is the conclusion. The Anand will be guilty of professional misconduct. You have to write whether he is guilty or not. And uh, as he allowed, you have to write reason for the conclusion there. And for the chartered accountant and vice, Vasu is neither in partnership nor in employment. This is how to you segregate. This five marks is divided into one mark for the clause and one mark for the provision and one mark for interpretation of how you have understood the provision. This one, you could write it your own. And one mark for the question of putting into, bringing the examiner into the scenario here. That is the situation and giving a conclusion, another more mark. Total five marks, you could bag it in your pocket. And now we'll move on with the next question here. Vishal, a practicing chartered accountant issued a certificate of circulation of a periodical without going through into most elementary details okay, of how circulation of periodical was being maintained. That is by not looking into financial records, bank statements, passbooks, not examining evidence of actual payment of bills and not caring to ascertain how many copies were sold and paid for. After you read this, how many clauses have come into your mind? There were mostly three clauses that would should have come into your mind. First thing, with regards to no examination, as they have used no examination of, um, uh, no examining evidence of actual payments, right? So second clause, part one, second schedule should have come into your mind. And grossly negligent has to also come into your mind because he had, they have given a list that he did not do, that he did not, uh, he did not do. And third one is the sufficient appropriate audit of that he did not made or taken sufficient information to do express an opinion. So how do you select one clause out of three that have come to your mind? First thing, first priority, what they have asked for. They have said that without going into most elementary details, details means information that is sufficient information that is clause eight, part one, second schedule. We'll see the answer here, clause eight, part one, second schedule. What all the extra information that have given were just supporting the without going into most elementary details portion only. The main hero here for the question is without going into most elementary details. Like the same thing, we have another question with regards to uh, clause 7 of part 1 second schedule that is cross negligence etc. Right? We'll read the question and determine how uh, this clause 7 has to be determined. Mr. Nemi, a chartered accountant in practice, is the auditor of Sum Limited. He advised the managing director of the company to include orders under negotiation in sales to reflect higher profit. You see, he is only advising uh, for higher profit orders under negotiation where the sale agreement was not put in place. So, sale agreement was not at all entered and better financial position that is his window dressing. Mr. Nemi thereafter gave clean reports on the balance sheet prepared accordingly without informing the exam without examining the accounts. Even for here, we have two to three uh, clauses that comes to in our mind. Here, without examining clause two, part one, second schedule, not examining. And there was like a gross negligence also, seventh one. And eight is with regards to uh, sufficient appropriate information and four with regards to expression of opinion. A lot of clauses come into our mind but how do we decide that is these clause 7 part 1 second schedule we have to again go with the first thing first priority that is he advised that is he only had intention he only had intention to window dress the balance sheet that is what gross negligence or without due diligence acting without due diligence that is what that is why they have more weight have come to clause 7 part 1 second schedule not to second clause to part one of second schedule that is not examination of financial statements and all okay so what all the question that they are talking about first we have to bifurcate the main hero of the film the keyword of the question to the, all the extra information all the extra adjectives that describe this hero element here also what they have said they have first said that he advised what the act he had done first he had advised and later on what he advised they have described the things we have to know uh, while the, deciding the clause we have to not go in detail for the description portion and all we have to first catch the clause at the first um, at the first act that the auditor is doing 
and for this second question we have to we have decided this is how you have to decide the loss and uh, failure to obtain information that is here without uh, going to the most elementary details that the basic details also so as per he would be guilty under clause a part one second schedule and uh, this is for for this one mark and uh, we have to write the provision that the accountant on practice fails to obtain sufficient information to warrant the expression and uh, this is what uh, with regards to the provision that is second mark you will get two marks here if you write these two if you write this clause itself wrong you will be end up with zero marks in the instant case you see uh, here what they have done since it is have given for five marks they have interpreted the provision on the intention of the provision since it is for only four marks you need not interpret the provision you could directly write or uh, the question itself in the answer that is you have to bring the all the information that was given in the question for that you will get one mark and for the conclusion the chartered accountant should not express his opinion before obtaining data so he would be guilty he would be held guilty under clause 8 part 1 for this you will get one more mark total four marks one mark for identification second mark for the provision third mark for the question that was given while bringing down the putting the uh, like what situation into the answer and fourth one fourth mark for the conclusion this is how you will be attain marks and if it's for a five mark you what you have to do in extra is after writing provision you have to interpret the provision by intention of the provision and uh, as we have already discussed this NEMI portion, we'll just complete that one first. Mr. NEMI is a chartered accountant advised to advise to increase the profit while in window dressing while making the orders under negotiation also as sales. Now, this is what gross negligent is. Clause 7, part 1, second schedule to the chartered accountants act, one mark. And that's how the chartered accountant practice. Uh, should be guilty of professional misconduct if he do not exercise due diligence or he is grossly negligent while conducting his professional duties. This is what the provision is. And with also that clause 2, part 4 of first schedule to the said act shall be the member of the institute which in practice shall be deemed to be guilty of such other misconduct. What is that clause 2, part 4 of first schedule is giving this, uh, that is, disrepute to the profession, that is, he is bringing disrepute to the profession. You see, auditor is the one who has to find the fraud in the financial statement. But he should. But what this NEMI is doing, he is encouraging the directors or encouraging the entity to do fraud, to do window dressing. This is what disreputing. Uh, disrepu this is what bringing disreputation to the profession. And um, so the two clauses were there here. And whether or not related to the professional. Okay, in this case, the, you see, this is for the first clause one mark identification and writing provisions another mark and then the clause two part four first schedule this is also identification of another clause i uh, will discuss in detail on a way before the examination what how, how how what clauses need to be accompanied with what like what are the supporting clauses and all like something that would support each other we'll just discuss it later in another video and uh, I'm writing about the question here with uh, what all the things that the NEMI asked the management to do and we have to write a conclusion that he was guilty of the professional misconduct four to five marks that's it you see these all the questions that we are discussing right now here were uh, from the latest RTPs and FTPs for May 2023 so this was so important if you read these uh, if you if you know how to uh, if you understand how to write the questions uh, answers for this it would be very easy for you you see professional ethics was a very limited kind of chapter where you need not learn a lot of things the chapter is also very simple you need not learn a vast amount of data like uh, for the banks and you need not have of uh, various mnemonics that were held in a like automated environment but if you write it simply these are uh, like this, the structure of the answer is also very simple. If you write this, you could bag four to uh, five marks for which the question. And now you'll see an interesting question which we often do not put so much of attention while reading to professional ethics chapter. This was even asked in MTP here. You see all the questions that were asked were in MTP, RTP. Mr. Seetal is a practicing chartered accountant, okay? Due to natural calamities and misfortune, he almost lost all his wealth and became undischarged insolvent. After a few court hearings, he finally declared as a discharged insolvent and obtained a certificate from the court. 
that stating that his insolvency was caused by misfortune without misconduct on his part. See, the certificate stating that he is insolvent, yes, but his insolvency is caused due to misfortune and not misconduct on his part. You are required to comment on the above situation with reference to the CA Act and schedules thereupon, referring to Section 8. You see, what Section 8 talks about? Section 8 talks about that when a chartered accountant or who is a member and whose name was there in the member's register has been declared by court as a discharged insolvent. The name has to be uh, debarred from the list of the, it has to be removed from the register of members unless that this insolvent was due to his misfortune, not by his contact. If it's that, if he got a certificate with that, then the name will not be removed from the register of members. This is what we are writing here. Section 8 of CA Act enumerates that. See, they are writing about, till here they are writing the provision. They have identified the section and they are writing the provision here. Actually, they have not identified. It was given already in the question. Enumerates that the circumstances which a person is debarred from having his name, that is, entered into the register of members. If he is a discharged insolvent and not obtained from a court, the certificate of stating his insolvency was caused by misfortune, not misconduct. When the name will be removed, when he do not obtain a certificate from court stating that the insolvency was caused due to misfortune, not his misconduct. Since he bought certificate that, so he is not liable to get his, uh, he is not debarred to remove uh, the name from the register of members. So we are writing that only here. And after the provision, what you have to write, you have to write what the, what they have given in the question itself for that extra one mark and write the question there and write the conclusion there. Mr. Seetal is not violated the provisions of Section 8 and he is not debarred from having his name entered into register of members as he had obtained certificate from court stating that insolvency is caused to misfortune, not misconduct on his part. Now we'll move on to the next question. Mr. Nageshwar, a CA in practice, was elected as a treasurer in RC of ICI. Okay. The RC had organized a tour for its members during the audit of RC, it was found that the treasurer Mr. Nageshwar had received a personal benefit of 40,000 from tour operator. Okay, what are all the clauses that will come to your mind? Since this is with regards to the money, you will get clause 10, part 1 of second schedule. This money, but make sure this clause would be only uh, active when the auditor for the auditor in practice. Here, though he was in practice, but he is acting as a treasurer. He was a treasurer now. He is not an auditor in practice. This is not with regards to the entity or the client. This is with the tour operator and the treasurer. Okay. So, that clause was not, uh, stands good here. And the, what that comes to your mind, thus bringing, bringing disreputation to the profession. Okay. First schedule or second schedule? You see, this comes under the other misconduct. There was no professional duties that were being carried here. What is a professional duty and other duty was? Professional duty, he was uh, doing like audit, giving certificates and all, attestation engagements, etc. These were the professional responsibilities. But being treasurer is not the professional trans, uh, responsibility. This is actually a service that, that could be done by many of trust and etc. And uh, this is also uh, mostly we don't find it often in uh, when we revise the professional standard. The section 8 that we have uh, revised before and section 21 here is provides a member liable for disciplinary action under misconduct. They have given both part 4 of first schedule and part 3 of second schedule other misconduct. And uh, you see uh, part 3 of second schedule why they have given is uh, for not... Uh, compliance with the Chartered Accountants Act and why they have given part 4 of first schedule is bringing this reputation to uh, the profession. That's why they have given here and you have to write the provisions if you ask for more marks and uh, the council had also laid down some things and um, misappropriation of office bearers and RC was a misconduct. They have referred to some provision here in the instant case. Again, writing the question here and writing a conclusion that's it and now we'll move on with the next question mr bahubali ca in practice wrote two letters to one s form of chartered accountant requesting him to allot some professional work 
and another letter to procure a firm of chartered accountants for some for securing professional work could he do that so yes he could do that he could secure or by writing a letter or by communicating from another chartered accountant that is allowed but not through any kind of circulars etc was not allowed so is he guilty here no he's not this is not actually a straight cut question clause 6 part 1 first schedule and you have to write the provision there and since it's asked for two months you have to need not elaborate the provision and write what was asked here uh, and write a conclusion that he is not guilty of any professional misconduct by soliciting the professional work from another chartered account and now we'll see our last question with regards to this mr s is a practicing chartered accountant and during weekends he do himself some equity research and advise his friends other than his clients that is he do not charge any kind of etc and apart from this he, what he's doing first he is doing equity research second thing he is also a paper setter for accountancy subject in his school which he studied okay and he also owned an agricultural land doing agricultural during his time okay multiple stores uh, of income multiple streams of income here three streams of income he is an equity researcher paper setter and an agriculturalist and uh, what due to his uh, natural calamities and misfortune there were heavy losses in agricultural activity and lost almost all his wealth and after course stating that his insolvency was caused due to misfortune without any misconduct on his part uh, this portion is something we have already seen right in one question okay they were they're asking about his uh, guilty of misconduct first thing what is doing is you see he involved in three activities he's a equity research advisor second thing paper setter and agriculturalist first thing with regards to equity researcher he could be an equity researcher as per ca act but he cannot publish a retail report with regards to that okay so he's not guilty of any misprofessional misconduct so with that one we are set and for the second one being a paper setter and agriculturalist he is involved in business or profession well he should not involved in business or profession other than the council permits to do whether those two things were permitted by ICI or not we have to check in regulation 190a yes they were allowed what are those owning an agricultural land and valuation of paper setter these were allowed in as per regulation 190a and so he is not guilty of any professional misconduct and the third thing is he was a insolvent he was discharged as insolvent we have already seen uh, that he it, since he obtains a certificate from court that he is not uh, he's insolvent not due to misconduct but through misfortune then he uh, the he needs not debar from uh, register of members he, to remove the name from the register of members so he is not debarred from section 8 as well